This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. And by IVPN. Resist online surveillance with IVPN, a privacy focused, audited, and transparent VPN provider that accepts Monero directly. And by Stealth EX, an instant exchange where privacy is the top concern. Go to StealthEX.io to instantly exchange between Monero and 450 plus assets without having to create an account or register and with no limits. Making Stealth EX a simple way to purchase Monero with crypto anonymously. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever. By typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Monero.com or Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk, we were live at LibertyCon 2022. Douglas Tuman interviews Dr. Wolf Van Leer, CEO of Students for Liberty, head organizer of LibertyCon, and a PhD in political economy. In this chat, the two discuss how the 2008 financial recession led Dr. Wolf to become a proponent of the Austrian School of Economics, the growth of LibertyCon in the past 15 years, the increasing hunger for liberty in the face of tyranny, governments killing cash, BTC's lack of privacy, dispelling Monero FUDs, and much more. Monero Talk starts now. We are live at LibertyCon in Miami. We literally just showed up and we happened to run into the guy who I believe is running it all. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. I'm the CEO of Students for Liberty and this conference, LibertyCon, is what we do here in the United States once a year, but we also have events like that in Europe, in Brazil, in Africa, you name it. And we have people over there. What is the focus and purpose of, the, of these events? As it's in the name, it's Liberty. Um, and we are focusing on bringing in diverse crowds of people that want to make a difference for the ideas. And you guys are doing it with cryptocurrency, with Monero specifically, but there's so many different ways, right? Journalists, academics, politicians, entrepreneurs. And we just bring a wide variety of people together. And then we take also specifically students who are interested in these ideas, give them training and empower them so much so that they can go out there. And last year they have organized like close to 2,000 events with over 215,000 people in a single year. That's amazing. Well, thank you. So uh, obviously, I guess I was going to ask you, so you're, are you seeing growth? And obviously, I, I guess you are, right? We're seeing tremendous growth. I mean, a few years ago, like five, six years ago, when I started as the CEO, because the organization is 14 years old now, um, we only had like 24 staff members. Now we have 76. And we were like maybe in 30 countries. Now we're in 113. And we have people in Venezuela, we have people in Vancouver, we have people in Montana, but also in Mozambique. It's, there's, a, there's a hunger for the ideas of liberty and for a foundation that can help people flourish and take ownership over their own lives everywhere. And that's what we're seeing. I mean, liberty is, is such a universal concept. But in reality, I don't know, you, you could tell me if you see things differently. I feel like maybe there's just a, a certain subset of people that are really, truly passionate about it. Although it should be everybody that should be concerned about their liberty. Do you have any opinion? Do you agree that there's some disconnect there? And if so, why do you think that's the case? I mean, it's true. I don't disagree with you. Um, but if you think about it, in the 1960s, libertarianism came for the first time in the United States. Of course, the ideas of liberty are much older, right? Going back to Adam Smith and even many more thinkers before that. But in the 1960s, you could fit like the whole liberty movement into an apartment in New York. Now look around you. We have 500 people in person here, plus minus. We have tens of thousands of people watching it online. And we have a global movement. You can find people here from 50 different countries. And it only takes, like, studies show, like a committed 10% of a population to bring really about change in the world. And we see more and more people taking charge. I mean, you're doing the work right now. You're spreading the word about Monero, and that's one way of bringing more privacy and, and you would argue, sound money to the world. That's crucial. That's one way. And it doesn't take many people to make a difference in the world. There might be you not know, like one thing that you should be doing, just, just politics, but there might be many different things that you could be doing and we are cultivating that. And even though we are only 15 years old, we have now a vice minister in Estonia. We have, sorry, Lithuania. We have, I think, three or four people in the, in the Congress of Brazil. We have people that um, were, were working on the Council of Economic Advisors here in the United States. 
and the last president. Change takes time, but we are just taking good people, give them the right ideas, the right training, and over the long run, we think all of them will permeate society in different ways and make a difference that way. So it's nice that we're seeing the liberty movement growing, but obviously also it's in reaction to the fact that the totalitarian movement is also growing. Yeah. Um, what's your comment on that? When you, you were asking about that, it's, it's liberty for everyone, basically. And the, it's, it's counterintuitive, like understanding, for instance, like the price system and why this is good. It's complicated. Society is complex and our brains are not very well designed for understanding all of these interactions. Government is an easy answer. You have a problem, that's the nail, the government is the hammer, you know, just regulate it. You don't get enough money, minimum wage. Doesn't matter that there's a lot of unintended consequences and people will just use machines instead of people. It takes time and studying and many people just want to live their lives. And not everybody needs to focus on ideas. But I think the more we're seeing in the world with inflation right now, with central banks uh, really putting us into a mess, more and more people will ask questions. Because I got into these ideas back in 2008 during the Great Financial Recession, right? And then I, for the first time I started asking the question like, okay, like, why are we in this mess? And everybody's saying, it was capitalism, it was the banker's fault. But that answer was way too simplistic for my taste. And so I started Googling and I found out about the Austrian thinkers like Mises and Hayek and Rothbard and others. And that got me on a, on a rabbit hole that led me to actually get a master's degree in Austrian economics and then a PhD in, in, in under like a classical liberal. And this is my life now, but it's totally fine for people to just think a little bit more about this and, and find a way how they can increase liberty for their own lives and for the lives of the people around them. And I think over time, we will go into the right direction. Do you think overall, currently, the liberty index is, is currently going up or going down? Unfortunately, it's going down. So I would say that in the short to medium run, I'm like more pessimistic, but long run, I'm optimistic. Because we don't only have to look at like the indices and governments becoming like more controlling. And we're fighting against that. Like we had people um, protesting against police brutality in Nigeria. We had people going to be imprisoned in Belarus. We had people being imprisoned in Myanmar. Like some of my staff got threatened by just by the speakers that we have here. Because if you stand up for any kind of political freedom, people will go after you. It's true. And we have seen that trend. But on the other hand, we are more connected than we ever were in the world. The environment is doing on a global level better. Uh, women are doing much better in terms of like access to education. And yes, there are setbacks if you look to Afghanistan. But generally, it's not like a homogeneous story that everything is going worse. And the media generally reports about like the stuff that's not going well, right? Because if you have a hurricane, that's interesting. You make the news. But if you have like fewer and fewer hurricanes, or if you have like more and more people starting businesses, that's not sexy enough to make it to the news. And so. Having also the mindset as a pro-liberty advocate makes you more appreciative of like what markets, free exchange, free speech actually gets us and how privileged we are, even though, yes, there are problems, but let's solve them. I mean, we saw with COVID, right, uh, that most people's reaction to that was to just go along with it, to accept what the government to was telling people to do. Uh, do you think we're going to see that same type of response with things like digital IDs and central bank digital currencies? Are people just going to opt in or are they going to wake up and opt out into things like Bitcoin or Monero? That's a tough question. Um, as an Austrian uh, economist, uh, originally from Germany, but I'm um, believing in the Austrian School of Economics, which if your listeners and viewers have not checked that out yet, they should definitely look into it. I don't believe specifically in concrete predictions, but in pattern predictions. I do think that it takes crises for people to rethink, rethink, rethink things. And I think we will see a crisis sooner rather than later, because right now over 2 billion people live under 10% inflation or more. We have seen debt levels that we have not seen in the world, right? And Volcker was able to, to increase the interest rates back in the 1970s because the United States only had like the GDP to debt ratio was 25%. Now it's over 130%. This is not sustainable, and the system will not be able to perpetuate itself forever. But fear has been, since the beginning of time, the tool of tyrants and government to tell people like, hey, you need us. Believe in us and what we're doing. You have a nail, you have seen inflation, believe us. But I think more and more people will question that. And I think, unfortunately, pain 
and getting that in your own pocketbook and seeing that the world is not like as it should be, more and more people will question that and hopefully you'll find ways to, to make a big difference. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans. And if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, gratuitous, and Monero. Now, we had a little sidebar before this, and I know you're, you're a Bitcoin guy. I'm a Monero guy who used to be a Bitcoin guy. And the reason I became one is because I'm concerned with the fact that Bitcoin is completely traceable. Yeah. And my concern is that it could effectively become a CBDC, co-opted by governments where all transactions are tracked and traced. What's your take on that? So I like the idea of Monero. One thing that I don't understand yet and I don't know how to solve that is talking to like a bunch of um, Bitcoin core programmers. Because I also spoke at like Bitcoin Miami and I'm going to be at the Pacific uh, Bitcoin conference that Swan puts up, is you have a trade-off between privacy and then also the accountability. Because if everything is completely private, how do I know that like not people at Monero like are gonna increase the money supply? Can I verify that at any given point in time? Um, and I don't understand that that's entirely possible. Maybe you can correct me if that's the case. But that's what I, what I think the trade-off is. And now Bitcoin is only the level of one. Right? That's, that's the core. But then you put the Lightning Network on top of that and so many more things and you can increase the transparency. And it's, it's just such a nation technology still, even though it has like, what, 300, 400 million users. I believe there will be like more ways of going about doing this. And um, yeah, that, that's what I see the trade-off and that's the reason why I'm more of a Bitcoin guy than a Monero guy. Understandable. I do think that's a bit of, uh, maybe not misinformation, but uh, a little bit of a misunderstanding. Okay. Uh, Bitcoin, I mean, Monero, like, like Bitcoin, at the end of the day, is code, right? Sure. So it's the code that's basically validating the, the amount of currency that exists at, at any moment in time. And if you trust that the code has been properly verified and properly implemented, then you trust that Monero works as intended, which is basically the same exact uh, leap of faith that needs to be made with, with Bitcoin. You could certainly get into it more, but I don't want to, you know, bore, bore my audience who we, we talk about this all the time. But the short answer is yes, Monero is, is just as limited in supply as Bitcoin. And you're relying on the same basic principles, which is math and cryptography and the implementation of code. Yeah, the other question would be about that. And I'm glad to hear that. I mean, that makes sense. It's a cryptocurrency. But how easy or hard is it to be changed? Because we had the block wars in, in like previous years in Bitcoin and people tried to change the money supply. And they had the majority of the hash rate, they had all the VIPs behind it, big names, and they still failed because of the incentive framework. I have not seen Manuel going through like the same crash test. Maybe it already existed, I'm just ignorant about it because I haven't studied it that much. Um, but that would be like my next my next question. And if you if you tell me you can run a node and can always see like what the what the total amount of, of that is, and you can believe that, that's that's good. But with, with Bitcoin, it's, it's very transparent, and it has been always attacked all the time, and it has been very robust. Yeah, one hundred percent, you can do that with the node. Um, but do you see? So do you see Bitcoin's transparency as a potential flaw? You know, we're you know we're Liberty guys. We we have uh, you know a knack for sniffing out something that may lead us down the wrong road. When you look at Bitcoin, let's let's pretend that you you know that we agree that it, that it's possible to create something that is uh, private on the protocol level. Yeah. Do you see Bitcoin's lack of privacy on the protocol level a potential issue with regards to being able to mass surveil the, the chain? Look, if you can get absolute privacy and absolute accountability, of course it would be preferred. I was led to believe that there is a trade-off and it's not that easy and it's not that easily believable and accountable. And I just want to put all the money that I put on uh, where my mouth is on the currency that I think has the most believable monetary policy. And so that's how I came to that conclusion. But you're right. I mean, if you can get absolute privacy, that would be lovely um, on top of that. And that would be great. What do you think of this, this concept that 
they can kill cash, but they can't kill Monero or Bitcoin, whatever it may be. What do you think of this idea that they're they're trying to kill cash and effectively are going to kill cash? Do you see crypto as being the solution to that? And do you think that's vital? Do we need a cash utility in our world? So I would say that there is a war against cash in many different countries, and it is in the interest of of the government, as you've already said, to have that control and be able to manipulate interest rates for people differently and we like punish rich people and, and give like more of the poor people and all kinds of different things, but also very harmful things because I'm working with a lot of human rights activists as well. And the first thing that happens to them is they get their bank, bank accounts taken away, right? So it's a huge, huge problem. If the government has control over that, they can control everything. So it's, it's a huge issue. And I think like if they can, can uh, take cash away, that is an issue and we should be fighting that. But I think generally people say like, okay, I can do transactions faster and I can use CBDCs. They will probably opt in for that. But it's good that programs like yours, and I've written an article about CBDCs as well in uh, Coindesk, I believe. I'm, I'm skeptical of them. However, the transparency that the CBDCs bring to the government, it might also go in the other way. Because if you can see like how many of the bail-ins and bailouts are happening within the banks, that might be not in the interest of the banking system. So I'm of two hearts um, on, on that right now, but we'll see. But I'd, I'd love more privacy, and I'm glad that there, are, there is Monero, um, and I'm glad that there's Bitcoin, which also gives you privacy, not as much as Monero, but it's definitely very helpful too. And it already empowers millions of millions of people that have, would not have any access to financial transactions or um, services like that whatsoever. Would you say that most people that are here at this conference are aware of this idea that they're trying to kill cash? Interesting question. I mean, we have a pro-liberty audience here, so I would say like, yes, but I'm not sure like how many people actually worry about that. Because most young people, and we have our targeted demographics as Gen Z. And Is this something we should be like yelling from the rooftops, getting the word out to the liberty community? Like they're, they're trying to kill cash. Well, they ha where, do you, where do you rate that in terms okay. of importance? I would say I would start with the most important thing for people to understand is how what money is and how it works and how central banks manipulate that and how central banks are in bed with the banks and is back with the government as well and how all of that works. I think that that's once people understand money, they will ask more questions and they say like, hmm, why do they want to look at our cash? Like, why does there need to be so much surveillance? And I think that's that's the main point. I don't think if you say like, hey, your cash will be taken away, most people say like, I don't care, like it doesn't affect me. Yeah. I don't, I don't give it. But if they understand how perpetual wars are being financed by money, how governments get more and more indebted by the money that we have right now, how inequality is perpetuated and increased by fiat money that we have today, then I think a whole different perspective opens up to them and then they will ask other questions. How about the free speech component of cash? The fact that it allows you to... Uh, put your put your money where your mouth or your thoughts are right you can uh, I could take out a hundred dollars and maybe go donate to the ladies of liberty over there and nobody in the world knows I did that yeah. do you think there is great value and importance in having a tool that allows people to uh, transact in a way where a government can't see or stop where they're putting their money hundred percent but I think it has doesn't have like a huge appeal because most people will most likely, hopefully, never be targeted by that. So this only becomes important once you're targeted. And I have the fortunate privilege to work with people that live in countries and have been targeted over and over again. And it's heartbreaking when this happens. And when from one day to another, you have lose all access to your money. It's, it's, it can be a death sentence. So it's of utmost importance. However, most people will not see it that way. And it's like, I'm not doing anything that would risk that happening to you. But maybe you at some point, like, I don't know, maybe you're a Republican. Right? Or maybe like you're a Democrat and the Republicans are in power and they want to control you. How do you know it will not happen to you in the future? So there is a risk, but I don't think most people will realize it until it's probably too late. Thank you so much, man. Greatly appreciate you taking the time and thank you for all of this. Well, thank you so much for what you're doing as well. Cheers. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. 
and please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.